Hey, what's up, math friends? We got a little ambitious in our last video trying to describe the entire Virasoto operator construction in one go. That video would have been like 45 minutes long, which is too long for all kinds of reasons. So instead, we're going to cut it into pieces. The first piece that I need to discuss goes back to the idea of a Heisenberg algebra, specifically the canonical Heisenberg algebra realized from a finite dimensional vector space. We say canonical because we mean that in a category theoretic sense, uh, more precisely that there is a functor from the category of finite dimensional vector spaces to the category of Lie algebras, <laughs> um, which will realize our Heisenberg algebras. So before we get into too much of what those details are, let's first describe the construction. <laughs> Once again, on the trails at Orcas, I have never been out this way before. There's a little, there's a little trail over there that I've never seen, so I'm interested to check it out. Uh, that will be the backdrop for our discussion. It's a little colder than we anticipated, but I guess we should have noticed all of the frost that was on the ground. Um, but it's okay, sun shining. Anyway, hopefully it's not too much of a surprise uh, that we can take any vector space of finite dimension and convert it to a Lie algebra that is abelian uh, by fiat, simply demanding that they commute. That's not a big deal at all. Uh, and so for some generic vector space H, we promote it to a Lie algebra in this fashion. Then we can consider the extended affine Lie algebra over this abelian Lie algebra, uh, which is to say we consider the affine Lie algebra with all this stuff, don't forget the central central terms, and then we extend it by uh, appending the degree derivation, right, which is just the operator t, d by dt, where t is, uh, you know, the formal variable that corresponds to the polynomials that we're interested in. I just saw a hawk. Okay, so let's very quickly uh, dis discuss the commutation relations of this extended affine Lie algebra. First, we have uh, the central element commutes with everything, no big deal. Uh, second, we are interested in the commutator of D with a generic element, let's say, uh, you know, H sub M, where H sub M is equal to H times T to the M. Um, so that just pulls the M down, right? So it measures the degree, right? Because we are uh, grading this um, affine Lie algebra by the powers of the formal variable T piece of cake, right? Okay, so then the only real commutator that we need to consider next is the generic commutator between two generic elements of the affine Lie algebra. Let's call them, I don't know, H, M, and G, N. Well, <laughs> you know, H and G commute uh, as operators in the, in the original Lie algebra, so no big deal. So really what we have is essential extension terms. Uh, and so that is just given by uh, the central charge C of the theory times m, the degree of one of them, uh, times the delta function, or the Kronecker delta, uh, m plus n and zero. In other words, um, we're only really worried about these central terms. Triple tree. It's getting noisy down there, so we should finish this up. So to consider the, to find a Heisenberg algebra out of this mess, what we need to do is consider the commutator ideal. Remember that from two episodes ago? The commutator ideal of this particular Lie algebra. So what is that? Well, no, nothing can commute to give you the D operator. So the degree operator is not part of the commutator ideal. Throw that out. Uh, naively, you would think, well, nothing really can give you the central charge. So, well, I'm not going to worry about that right now. But I can commute D with... The, uh, with a generic element, h of m, and that gives me an element, uh, right? m times h of m. So h of m, these generic elements, are definitely uh, in the commutator ideal. Awesome. Uh, notice that that's why we needed the degree operator. <laughs> that's why we needed to do these extensions. Uh, but also, we can commute two uh, generic elements, say h, m, and g, n, one more time, and we get this central term, which picks up the central charge. So indeed, uh, because of the degree derivation, 
we end up with a generic element with m not equal to zero belonging to the commutator ideal, which implicitly drags along the central charge with it. So, in other words, the commutator ideal of the extended affine Lie algebra associated to a Lie algebra that's abelian is given by all the non-zero generic terms and c. It's pretty easy to check that it is a Heisenberg Lie algebra. Uh, notably, right, the center is just C, proportional to C. Uh, and then you can do that pairwise decomposition by looking at positively and negatively graded um, elements. That is to say, H where M is positive and H of M where M is negative. Easy. And therefore, by the Stone von Neumann theorem and similar constructions we've been discussing already, we know that there is a irreducible representation, uh, that is to say, a module for this Heisenberg algebra that is just given by the symmetric algebra over the negatively graded subspace. That is to say, all powers uh, of h times t to the m, where m is less than zero. So that, in gory detail, is the construction of our functor from the category of finite dimensional vector spaces to the category of Lie algebras. Its actions on the objects, that is to say the vector spaces themselves, are simply given by the commutator ideal of the extended affine Lie algebra associated to the abelian Lie algebra that naturally comes from considering a vanishing Lie bracket on that vector space. Good. So. To complete our definition of the functor, we also need to consider the maps between morphisms, that is to say the maps between linear transformations on one hand and Lie algebra homomorphisms on the other hand. But of course, since the underlying Lie algebra of our construction is abelian, there's really not much to do. That is to say the maps, they essentially map to linear maps in their own right. The rest of the structure involving the grading and the, the polynomials and the central charge and the, and the degree derivation all comes along for the ride pretty much for free in a fixed canonical way. So like many things in category theory, this is more of an observation <laughs> than a non-trivial proof. Nevertheless, it'll be helpful to have it as a benchmark for future discussions. Despite the fact that we can associate a specific heisenberg lie algebra to a specific finite dimensional vector space, this does not mean that the functor under consideration is by any means unique. Of course, we can consider a whole bunch of different ones. Notably, the one in the past that we've considered is kind of the twisted version of this construction, where we take our finite dimensional vector space and we include an involution, which literally maps every element of that vector space to minus itself. So in some sense, the maximal involution, whereas in every element is odd. Um, and then we can use that to twist the extended affine Lie algebra, which essentially gives us the linear span of all h times t to the 2m plus 1 over 2, <laughs> uh, where m is, again, some, some integer, and h is any member of the underlying vector space, uh, taken, of course, with the span of the central charge. <laughs> that, of course, gives us our canonical twisted Heisenberg Lie algebra that we were discussing when we discussed twisted vertex operators. Um, and of course, being a Heisenberg algebra, it has that similar abelian decomposition into H0, H plus, and H minus, depending on the grading. Once again, we also have, um, by the Stone von Neumann theorem, uh, and essentially a unique irreducible representation of this algebra in terms of the symmetric algebra over the negatively graded abelian subalgebra of this twisted Heisenberg Lie algebra. There's lots more that we can and will say about these kinds of constructions. In particular, you can imagine, instead of creating infinite dimensional Heisenberg Lie algebras, you can imagine creating ones of finite dimension. There's all kinds of stuff to do. They're not necessarily along the same stream of thought though, so we're gonna put those aside for a little bit and come back to them later. Next time, we're gonna be talking about operators on these modules that we've just constructed for you. Um, and in particular, we'll talk about where the Vita Soto operators hide inside that space of operators. Cool, see you then. Yeah.